And this is different than anything, any clinic around. Workouts that are tailored for her, and that really makes a difference. It's really personal. I've gotten way more mobile, stronger, flexible. So everything just improves me to the next level. Welcome to the On Cue Performance Therapy Podcast, where we push sports performance and physical therapy to its apex. We change the game by bringing together the brightest minds in the field to offer best practices and question how things are done today. I'm your host, Mike Quintins, physical therapist and expert in sports orthopedics. I'm living my dream and opened a clinic that unites all elements of sports medicine under one roof to drive recovery and performance outcomes. All right, let's, let's get into it, Doc. I'm today with Dr. John Kelly. He is a physician, surgeon. Uh, Mike, John D. Kelly, the fourth. That's, that's a big deal. Fourth. I didn't, I didn't know that. And I, just, and I just had a fifth. You just had a, just had a fifth. So uh, what, what Dr. John D. Kelly, the fourth, uh, is most known for is um, his uh, stand-up comedy. Uh, more than he is a, a surgeon uh, for University of Pennsylvania, director of the um, uh, shoulder division, uh, ACLs, Achilles, right? And we can go on and on and on. But um, I think one of the things you're most proud of is, is uh, your, the, the seat you hold at the uh, Wharton School of Business or uh, that you've been recently uh, passed to um, smoke marijuana. So. Um, no. For, <laughs> no, but I, I'm sure that I, I, I want your, your take on what you are most um, proud of uh, in, in everything you've accomplished thus far. All right. You want to know what I'm most proud of? The fact that I've been married 33 years. Number one. Number two, mm -hmm. that I have twin daughters to die for, to die for. And I know some of the questions you sent me, Mike, is first of all, uh, just to be clear, I'm a director of shoulder sports medicine. I'm not director of shoulder division, just shoulder sports. And I'm an adjunct instructor at the, at the uh, Wharton School in the McNulty Leadership Program under the uh, aegis of a fellow named Mike Usine. I like to talk today about leadership, but my passions, but um, I, uh, my legacy, and that's one of the questions you sent me, is my family and my marriage and my children. That's, your real, that's, that's a person's real legacy in life. And as you have a newborn and you'll learn, uh, my friend, that uh, the greatest legacy you can give your children, your child, is to love your wife. You know, we're in a security uh, sort of a crisis in this country. And I think it's the dissolution of the family unit, which is to blame of where we are as a country and the loss of uh, values, the loss of, uh, of dignity, of, of regarding life and uh, individual worth is in, in large measure due to the dissolution of the family unit and it's never too late never too late so i think that each man on this call needs to man up and be the best husband they can and that's going to be a the, one of the probably the greatest things we can do to resurrect this country from the ashes so anyway um i, I am passionate about many things uh, one is my faith number one uh, number two is uh, my vocation which is to be a father a husband number one and a father number two and the third is an orthopedic surgeon and um I think that uh, I study leadership because I, I realize the importance of leadership. It's not just, it's not some sort of ethereal, you know, cosmic concept. It's a real skill set to lead. And if I, I tell the listeners, if you want to accomplish something good, something great, something of, a, of an impact in your life, that's going to be service oriented, particularly you need leadership skills. It just doesn't happen. You know, the old expression, Mike, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Some people can, can want the greatest things in the world, but if they don't know how to get from point A to point B, you know, so I'd like to talk tonight about, you know, what it means to lead, what are leadership skills? Um, why, why even bother leading? Let's start with that. Let's start, let's, let's start with why, Where, what's, what's your why? My why is that everybody searches in their lives for meaning, right? There's a great book, by a fellow named Viktor Frankl, who was a, a Holocaust survivor, psychologist. And he said, you know, the title was Man's Search for Meaning. And Viktor Frankl said, if you could figure out a, a why 
then you almost always come up with a how. So, so why, why are we on this earth? You know, the fundamental questions are, you know, why are we on this earth? And what are we, what are we here for? And, and all the great writers have come up with meaning. You need meaning. You need purpose. You know, there's a great book called The Purpose of Driven Life. You need to have a reason to get up in the morning. And the purpose really that, as you've been uniformly been found to be true in the literature, is, is service. You know, we want to make an impact to those around us, to the world, and uh, leave some measure of, um, of improvement to the world. When you, when you die on your deathbed, you, you, see, you want to say to yourself, was I a good husband, Mike? Was I a good father? And did, did I serve the planet? Did I make a difference? And if the answer to those three questions are yes, yes, and yes, you're going to be at peace. So don't forget... Um, um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, don't, don't, don't forget. Victor Frankl said this big soundbite was, if you can find a why, you'll come up with a how. So I, I, why? I love that. I, we, um, that's something where I saw it initially. But we, I have it, you know, glued right here on my, on my laptop. You know, why? Big old question mark. Uh, and, you know, taped on a sheet of paper is, are the, the five reasons why I, I do what I do every day. Um, so, so that makes perfect sense to me. You have your why. Now what's your how? Why it's, it's nice to have a reminder of that. You know? there's, there's a great book uh, I recommend to the readers or listeners. Uh, it's Good to Great by, uh, by Collins. And he talks about level five leaders and they're servant leaders. So probably the single biggest soundbite I can give the audience tonight about leadership is guess what? It ain't about you. It ain't about you. And, you know, we just went through playoff season with the college bowl series and I was a big football fan. I played in college, as you know, and uh, um, we're talking about leadership mentors, a football coach I have, but the greatest coaches that I've ever played for or experienced in life were the life coaches, right? Uh, they're the people that taught you how to live your life and how they invested in, in, in the players, not just as a means to them, but just really appreciate with them. And, you know, there's an old expression, they don't care how much you know until, until they know how much you care. And you look at the greatest coaches, you know, Nick Saban, despite – all the criticism he's had, he's in very invested in his players, very invested. He's a mentor. So the greatest leaders, number one, it's not about them. It's about a higher purpose, higher calling. It's about if you're a CEO of a, of a company, it's about the company. It's not about you. Yep. Um, and people get that. People get that. And when you start living your life that way, uh, it brings you great joy to see other people succeed. And that's the why. What's the why? To make the company do well. And then you start realizing, you know, we spend so much time defending our egos and, and making it make, you know, padding our, our wallets and making sure we're successful. This, all that energy should be devoted towards what's best for, the, for our organization. And, you know, the, great, the greatest leaders, you don't really, you don't often even know they're there. They're just behind the scenes, making little moves here and there, not out in the, not out in the forefront. And to do that effectively, it needs certain core values. And number one, number one's integrity. You know, I was talking to someone today, a patient today in the office, and he's a trustee for a major university. And you're talking about the football program. And he's like, well, you know what? The coach doesn't have integrity. No integrity. There's no mission. There's no buy-in. People aren't going to follow you. If you don't walk the talk every day, people are going to say, well, why should I do this when he, he himself doesn't do that? I, so, I love what you're saying. Love you know, I, I, I've, I've never been happy. I'm 64 now. I'm getting more done in less time because I've totally, I've tried to totally forget about me and say, what's good for our shoulder division, what's good for my residency, uh, what's good for my, uh, the research division here. And I, I just did a major uh, research uh, publication and the, the guy said, you want to be first author? No, I don't care. I don't care. If first. It was my idea, but guess what? I've seen so many people develop their talents in writing this paper. It was actually on the, you like this, like on the uh, frozen shoulder. And we looked at diabetics, non-diabetics. We took RNA samples from the shoulder capsules and we had this genomic expression. And we found out there's two different diseases. And it's like, wow, this is going to help target therapies. And the uh, junior author says, do, do, do you care about being first? First, like, No, just get it published. I don't, I really don't care. So, so this well, paper I, is going to help. Yeah, it's going to help so many people. I got to, I got to get the conclusion. Speech, so. The conclusion is that once you become diabetic, it's a different disease, frozen shoulder. And yeah. It's a different genomic expression. So uh, it's much more inflammatory and it's much more uh, virulent. 
it's a different disease than your generic frozen shoulder. So you got to really be much more careful and you're probably a little more aggressive with the steroid injections and with the anti-inflammatory diet. And actually er, I pulled the trigger earlier with manipulation and capsule release. So it's, it's a different disease model. So you have to know, and, and then hopefully it'll lead to different interventions, maybe more targeted anti-inflammatory treatments. Um, so, Interesting. Yeah, because uh, previous research that I'm familiar with is steroid injection and PT. That combination is better than just the steroid injection and just the PT. So when you put them two together is when you get the best results. Now, if you're, now you're saying with diabetics, you should be more aggressive with the anti-inflammatory approach. So the injections, um, and maybe early, oral, early, oral steroid, so. Oral and injection early. and tight, tight glycemic control. Uh, we're looking at adding uh, metformin and something called Farsiga, which is a uh, anti-diabetic medication. So we have other different permutations with this, but also you know, make sure you inject intraarticularly, not subacromial. And yep. it's always anterior in my hands, better than posteriorly. Um, so uh, it's it just, it just fun right. stuff. So anyway, um, the, the other sound I want to mention to you is that, you know, when you want to distill leadership into one word, one soundbite, it's who you are, who you are. All your, the people that you work with uh, at your facility, Mike, which for the audience is a wonderful facility because Mike Quinton says really good um, um, ethically based care. But leadership is, is really who you are. All your employees look at every single thing you do, how you treat the cleaning lady, how you treat the, the wealthy client versus the person with the marginal insurance. So everything you do, that conveys leadership. And there's a great quote. You and I are both Catholic, and I'm you know, both proud of it. The parable of the lost sheep. You know, how you treat the lost sheep, the 99 look at. So we just had a little problem with one of our residents and everybody's looking at how are we going to treat that lost sheep because the 99 are watching, right? So you have the, you know, in my vocation, we have what we call the apparent genius. We have sometimes people that are so smart, they sometimes lose sense of uh, social mores and, and emotional intelligence. You know, you say, I can't believe they did that. But a real leader says, let, let me get this person the help they need. You know, it's how to manage those aberrant personalities which really don't mean any ill will and that's that's the key to success is the lost sheep how do you manage that so everybody's looking at everything you do and i know some great great surgeons that will that will go out of the way to treat the vip but they won't even see uninsured patients you know and the residents see that, that that's not leadership that's amen. selfishness amen, that's, amen. That's, that's, that's well said well i mean i think you nailed it with that especially that last line there you know so it's all the the vocations that you and I have taken um, involve a degree of service. Uh, it's not all service, um, and, and therefore we have a responsibility uh, not only to uh, patients who can afford to see us, uh, but perhaps even to patients who cannot afford us. So that's right. to me, that's a big deal. And you know, Mike, and, and people, we're in this burnout phase here with the COVID and everything. And I say to the residents, I say, you want to avoid burnout. Focus on the vocation. You know, what you and I do every day is such a wonderful gift. And, um, you know, the Christian perspective is like Mother Teresa said, I see the face of Christ wherever I, who I can tend to. So I try to see this is who, who's God sending me next. Right? Who's sending me next? And uh, look at that face. And I've had some people demanding. And, and the whole COVID thing has just added layers upon layers of stress. And we got people that are out of work and they're yelling at me because I haven't given them the purpose at whatever. So you just see the face of, of God and that you just be patient and realize that it's the, it's the vocation that I go to bed at night and say, hey, I think I did a good job. I think I served today. Um, you know, one of the questions I want to get to, Mike, is, uh, um, you know, what leadership influence I had in my life. And, yeah. uh, you know, I was blessed with a, a Marine Corps drill instructor father who taught me what was right and wrong, you know, and he also taught me the value of grit. And uh, there's a great book out by uh, Angela Duckworth I recommend to our listeners called Grit. It's a power of passion and perseverance. So when, you, when I tell this story, people think my dad was some sort of whack job, but he wasn't. He was a genius. He would take my twin brother and I to the YMCA and he would say, you're going to stay in this sauna until I tell you to leave. I was a little kid. I was like, you know, people out there are saying he could have killed you. But what he was doing was teaching my brother and I grit. And he would take us to these boxing gyms. He said, you're going to fight this guy today. I'm like, Ugh. 
But what he was doing over the years was just teaching us grit. So he was just a guy that, you know, quitting was just not an option. It just wasn't an option for us. So I look at my life and I say, my dad was a great influence in leadership because if you want to get along in life, Angus Duckworth would tell you, you got to have grit. You know, you know, Bear Bryant, the great football coach, one of the greatest football coaches of all time says, you know, you quit in football, you're going to quit in life. You quit in life, you're going to be a failure. And that was one thing my dad knew, you know, quitting was never an option. And I have my twin brother now, who I want to announce to the audience is my hero because he's fighting gallbladder cancer and he's working out. He's a lawyer. He's trying cases. He just, he just hasn't missed a beat. He, uh, oh, he's still, God bless him. I'm happy to hear he's, he's, he's doing well. He, he's he's well. my hero. I mean, he's talking about mine too. And, and it was a guy, we both played the, in the Ivy league in the seventies. And I saw him one day, we had an all East tackle. I saw him one day punch him in an uppercut because he was held in practice and made this guy cry. I'm like, this guy is a tough dude. So it, it's great seeing grit in action. And the other influences I had, though, really um, were some football coaches. I played under a guy named Bill Campbell, who left football coaching in the Ivy League in the 70s, became board, I believe, board chairman for Apple. And he basically ran Google and uh, Apple. He was a football coach and transitioned. And what he showed me was, he took the Catholic values of integrity, honesty, and leadership of service with grit. And that's a deadly combination. So that was encapsulation of, of leadership. Toughness, making the hard calls, putting the, the corporation first. If you look up William V. Campbell, there's the Campbell Award in football. When he died, uh, there was a moment of silence on NASDAQ because this guy basically ran Google and Apple. But he did it through toughness and integrity and if something that came across the board that wasn't good for the company he wanted no part of it but he could also make the hard call and say now what, what are we doing here what, what are you guys you, we gotta, you gotta move on you gotta get rid of this company and and do it so you know leadership is also not it's not about being an approval addict people liking you which i suffered from many many years of my life because you know irish catholic growing up and people to like you and i kind of got rid of that as soon as I could, because I realized it was better to, to do right and to be liked. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, people aren't going to like you, but they're going to respect you. They are going to respect you because say, you know, he, he did the right call. And the, the final uh, figure I want to mention in my life, I never, I only met him once, was a guy named Father Ted Hesburgh, who was the president of Notre Dame for like 35 years, who was the quintessence of, of leadership. And if those of you haven't read this book, it's called God, Country, Notre Dame. This guy became president of Notre Dame at age 36 or whatever, and just uh, made the endowment like tenfold higher, went from a good university to a world famous university because he had emotional intelligence, he had foresight, he had integrity, but he was decisive. He was decisive. You know, leaders take risks, they're not afraid to fail. And uh, we just had a, a part of our leadership curriculum. I'll talk about that, Mike, in a few minutes when yeah. we teach in our residence. Uh, we had a guy named Joe Moglia who was Bill Campbell part two. He went from football coaching, ready for this, become the CEO of Ameritrade, right? <laughs> and- uh, You can do a podcast just on that, on football coaches and then, transfer, and then transitioned from, over to he, the stock market. Yeah, and then he, uh, he like increased the uh, Ameritrade's assets like tenfold. And then he went back to coaching and became head coach of Coastal Carolina. So what I'm saying is that these two people, Bill Campbell and Joe Mobley, what do they have in common? Well, obviously they're highly intelligent. But they had grit, they had emotional intelligence, and they had, and you and I, you know, I'm not saying that Catholics have cornered the market on integrity, but they, Bill Campbell uh, was a deeply practicing Catholic, Joe Mowley went to Fordham, they had values, they had integrity, they, what they said they did, you know, integrity is basically, you know, saying what you do, or, or being what you say, saying when what no you do is, is, called, yep. is called honesty, just being what you say. If I said to you, Mike, I'm going to do this as podcast at five o'clock, I'm here. That's integrity, right? Yep. So, uh, you know, those are people that I've really influenced my life. I, my dad, my brother, Coach Campbell, and indirectly Coach Moglia, uh, who, um, you know, he, he, his credo was take responsibility for your actions, stand on your own two feet, and treat people with dignity and respect, right? So I remember we scrimmaged this high school and, and – uh, uh, when I was in high school many, many years ago. I'm, I'll tell you, I won't tell you I'm old, but uh, when I was a kid, Mike, the Dead Sea was still sick. 
Um, <laughs> oh, that's a good one. But I'm uh, and, 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 and you know, you know, you know, my favorite drink is my favorite drink now is Madam Useful. That's how old I am. <laughs> uh, and to me, pulling an all-nighter is not having to go to the men's room. Cuticle. But anyway, um, <laughs> we we, scrim we scrimmaged Coach Moglia, and he lived that about take responsibility for your actions. So um, as I'm watching the scrimmage. There was a bad call, and his players are going, boo, ref, you stink, ref. He turned around to the sideline to his players, and all he said was, shut up. That was it. In other words, we can't control the refs. Take responsibility for your actions. Stand on your own two feet and treat everybody with dignity and respect. What a wonderful – he took that formula of life and became the CEO of Ameritrade. You know, he went – he, he actually he, – he left, he left uh, Archmere Academy, which is in Wilmington. Sure. Got a job at Dartmouth, became defensive coordinator, and he realized, you know, I'm not really doing that well support my family on the coaching salary. He loved coaching. So he took a job at Merrill Lynch. And he's around age 40, and they had this MBA training program. And he looked around the room, and he said to himself, in two years, everyone in this room will be working for me. And guess what? They were. <laughs> they were. And not in the egoic sense, but I think he realized that his emotional intelligence, his street smarts, and his good old-fashioned grit was going to get him far, and it did. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think – so. Um... My, my takeaway on those four are, are obviously two are personal relationships. Uh, and even the third one seems to be, you know, someone that you, that you knew well as a coach. And then, and then the fourth one is someone you had met, uh, I think once, but uh, how they executed and lived out their life um, is, is something you emulated. And I feel like a lot of people would automatically say, you know, their dad, their one coach, and um, maybe like a teacher, but for you to, to even, pick out somebody who you uh, followed uh, or were a fan of and name them as an influence. I think that's, that's, um, that says a lot about you and, and your willingness to look for, for resources. Well, you, you know, everybody, everybody has a template for behavior. And sure. you and I both are Christians, you know, to me, it's, it's uh, the good Lord, Jesus Christ. You have to meant template your, your, your inner wisdom has to come from something that's changeless. And I'm telling to the reader, whatever faith you have, you need to have a changeless set of values to negotiate the changes in life. So and I tell our children, I said, every decision you make is going to be a sort of values you draw from. And either those values are going to be hardcore, set in stone, or they're going to be capricious, moving like the wind. And there's no security in that. There's no security. In that. So you have to have a transcendent belief system. And for me, it's my faith and, and, and uh, my Catholic faith is particularly, but um you know, uh, there's so much change going on, but if you just continually dedicate yourself to doing right, you know, I had the blessing of taking care of uh, the great Joe Frazier, the boxer, and he was a lot brighter than people think because he was from the South and he took some shots. You know, he had a little bit of speech from the shots, but he's a very, very deeply intelligent guy. And he had this credo. He would say, there's no wrong way to do right and no right way to do wrong. He, he realized back in the 80s, this whole spin generation, we spin doing you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, people that steal. Well, we just uh, diverted some funds, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, instead of like uh, uh, not fixing a rotator the cuff, the, you could hear a surgeon say, well, we decided to abort the procedure because it was retracted. Like, shut up, fix it. You know what I mean? You know, there's, there's so many spins that we hear. And Joe would say, there's no wrong way to do right and no right way to do wrong. And his son, Marvis, who uh, I used to train with. My father was a big boxer and he had me, you know, work with all these great fighters. He would say to his son, Marvis, and if you don't do that, you're going to smell this. He had this huge left hand, left hook. <laughs> but I like that. You're going to smell this. So what a great education he had as a Roman. So, uh, you know, one of the questions, Mike, we should get before the time gets uh, short is you talked about nature versus nurture. And yeah, how, how much of, of leadership is, yeah, how much of your leadership skills uh, that you've, either, have, were they obtained? Do they come natural? To, to what extent is, are, are they taught or learned in your, in your opinion? Yeah, it's both. I look back at my life and I think I was kind of with uh, Collins with okay, level one, level two. You know, I was captain of three sports in high school, blah, blah, blah. Of course, my high school wasn't very big. If you had a pulse, you were a starter, right? 
Uh, and uh, we had uh, my senior year, we, we had three wins. We beat Mary and Mercy Academy, uh, Notre Dame Academy, and uh, I won't go there. But anyway, I went to a really private school. But uh, those are all uh, those I think are all girls schools. Yeah. Uh, oh, got it. Right. Good Just answer. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got, uh, got it. That's before I took steroids. Don't forget. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think that to really be a true leader, uh, a true level five leader, there's a skill set that you have to learn. And I think it's important to read books on great leaders and they all share common qualities. Number one is integrity. Number two is they're great at team building, right? Team building, consensus building. Um, and number three, they all had a good amount of emotional intelligence. They could, could you know, rally the troops. Um, but the most important quality is servitude. You know, the greatest leaders, it wasn't about them. They put the mission first. And there's a great book there that the listeners can also uh, read. It's called uh, uh, by the Navy SEALs, Extreme Ownership. And oh, yeah. the SEALs yeah, preach, no matter what happens on the mission, own it. It goes back to Coach Mowgli. Take responsibility for your actions, right? So I look back at all my mistakes in my life, mistakes, and I realize that I own them. And there's always a gift. You see, we, people of faith look at, you know, uh, the universe as God is always working for their benefit, right? So I think a, a real leader always says, I want to keep moving forward. I want to evolve. I want to look for the gift of my failures. You know, uh, was it Harry Potter took like 20 uh, editions before finally got accepted? Um, Thomas Edison had like, I don't know, 30 failures. You know, you got to yeah. keep moving forward and realize that, you know, when you say, hey, God's got my back. I'm going, to, I'm going to try something today. You know, Mother Teresa says, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest problems is people don't risk. God's got your back. What are you worried about? You know, just, it's okay to fail as long as your heart's in the right spot. And you take calculated risk. You don't just say, well, I'm going to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. No. Uh, but my success of late has been predicated on just taking risks. And here's the other thing that people have to fight. Many of us in this generation, we have this perfectionist culture where people are just afraid to make mistakes. They're afraid to fail. And that's where the real treasure lies. You know, you got to get in the saddle. You got to make mistakes and realize that there's a great quote by a philosopher named Rumi that the universe is always working in your favor. Remember that. So every failure you have, I look back at my life and I say, okay, was it a failure or was it a gift? Well, I told you about my uh, football career. I played in the Ivy League in the 70s. And I, I had a dream of maybe getting a tryout with some team someday. In my junior year, I tore my ACL. So, oh, man. Well, two things happened. Number one, I had a team doctor that became my hero. And I said, I want to be that guy. And number two, I realized I couldn't play football forever. My GPA went from a 2.7 to a 3.9. So where's the gift? And the thirdly, whenever someone has an ACL tear, I look at them in the eye and say, I know what you're going through. The empathy gene, right? So the other example I want to give about where's the gift. About 15 years ago, I went through this frivolous lawsuit. It was about somebody had a side effect of a medication they took. Nothing to do with the surgery at all. But I, I got hung out to dry. It was like I had to go to court. You know, it was about a the person had a side effect to a medication. It didn't take as prescribed. But anyway, make a long story short, you know, I took it to heart. And my dad had uh, Parkinson's. He was dying. And I uh, was dealing with some, uh, my wife and I, who was a saint, were dealing through some like fertility issues. So I was like rock bottom. You know, they always say you got to hit rock bottom. And I look back at that time and I had the, that awakening. It's like, I know you played sports, Mike. You know, if you're playing a game and you're behind at halftime, coach doesn't say, well, let's do everything we learned. Let's try this. Because no, no, let's go back to basics. Let's go back to fundamentals. And I went back to the fundamentals of happiness, my faith, my family, self-care, boundaries. You know, I, I went back to the fundamentals of wellness. So that dark time, my rock bottom, oh, I, I developed a serious eye infection, you know, that uh, I, I grew an organism that only supposed to happen to people with HIV. I'm like, man. And the doctor said, you get enough rest, son? I'm like, no, I'm not. That was my rock bottom. That was my wake-up call. So since that time, around 1999, I've dedicated a good part of my orthopedic life to physician wellness and especially the younger practitioner who's trying to make a living and also have a family like, don't, 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 don't make the same mistakes I did, please. 
self-care, number one, and get back to that value system, your faith, as you know, uh, however you know God, meet God where you are in your life, and it'll get you through that and consecrate your life to your family. Because you go through the journey and you've, and you, and you've I like to use the word, Mike, damaged your family. You know, so many of us professionals, we damage our children. We damage our spouses. Been there, done that. It ain't worth it. And I'm saying, look, 64 now. Don't do what I did when I was 38. Please. It's not worth it. What, what, what did you see when you were 38 that you had, um, that you were that hungry, that you were that hungry for going after that you found out later that, that it's not uh, what, that's not how we, we're going to do things going forward. You know, like it, what, what was driving you at the time? It, it was, uh, it was fear-based. I was afraid of failure and I was drinking the Kool-Aid of the culture that in order to be successful in orthopedic surgeon, you had to have this many cases. You had to have your Philly magazine, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm like realizing that's all, that was all just BS. The real success, it was my marriage of 33 years and the fact that I can go to work every day and say, uh, I'm here to help. And, you know, as a result of that, when you take the heat off, that's when your real creativity sort of explodes. And when you start taking the heat off, you said the real authentic self emerges. And I'm doing my best writing now. And I'm doing my best surgery now because I'm just like, let it flow. Let it flow. Don't just cramp your life. Don't try too hard. Let it flow and develop a develop some sort of uh, stress management practice. You know, I took a course, Mike, in, a, in mindfulness about 12 years ago. Game changer. Living in the moment is when you experience your best self, right? And uh, I think everybody should have some sort of quieting technique, whether it's yoga, uh, meditation, prayer. You know, um, you mentioned about how you got today where you are. And it, it was um, learning how to control my mind how to slow the motor, um, how to tap into that, you know, higher self that we all look for. And uh, it's been a game changer for me, man. I'm telling you, when you realize, you, when, you you realize you don't, when you realize you don't have to be successful, yeah. that's when you become successful. And there's a great book I quote all the time by Sean Acor. It's called The Happiness Advantage. And he talks about the major th thesis in the book, Mike, is not so much uh, we always thought we always got on the treadmill um, and we always felt that, you know, success leads to happiness. And Sean Aker in this book called The Happiness of Annie says, no, 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 no. Happiness leads to success. In, in your vocation, you know, you, you can imagine, you, would a patient like to see someone who's smiling? Hey, you got a back problem. That's how worse is like another back patient. Oh, boy. You know, body language is everything in this business. Uh, body language is everything. Same, the same goes for you. Yeah. And well, you know, like, again, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. That is so true. So uh, part of my success is my morning quiet time, which yep. is non-negotiable. Non. I have my alarm set for basically a half an hour early every morning. And I read a little scripture. I read my daily devotional. And then I have my gratitude journal. And I write every morning three things I'm grateful for. And I also write something that happened in 24 hours that it has meaning, meaning for me. And it was an, either it could be an encounter with a patient, could have been a meal with my wife, could have been a church service. And I do those things every day. Then I just put everything down and I just quiet my mind. And I do my little mindfulness exercise. And here is where the Catholic part comes in. And then I just let God love me for 60 seconds. Just let him love me. You know, if you can do that every day and change and just, and, and then what God tells me, and I have this drill, it's called Two Chairs. I bought a book by William Bodine called Two Chairs. And I have a chair and I pull up and I just talk to God every morning. And I just listen. I listen. I don't talk. I listen. And I'll ask, ask some questions. Hey, God, what do I do about this case today? Or what do I do about this uh, unusual, challenging resident? Uh, what do I do about, um, you know, this certain person in my life that's been challenging? And I listen and I get the answers every day. And you'd be surprised, Mike, like even some of the cases I have that are, you know, sometimes you, you know, I, I'm at the age right now of doing this orthopedics now for 30 years. I like the challenging cases. I want to say, hey, yeah, bring it on. And I'll say, uh, how do I handle this guy? And that quiet in my mind, 
I get these insights. I'm like, oh, 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 oh. so two chairs is a game changing book. Try the two chairs and we'll just pull up a chair with God. Just ask some questions and then quiet your mind and just listen. And that is how you change your life. I love it. I, to, uh, I've taken up meditation or quiet time, however, whatever you want to call it. I, I'd like the different practices that you engage in uh, during your quiet time. Uh, and uh, there are different purposes for each of those. You, you spoke about um, being in the moment. Uh, and that's something Michael Jordan speaks about, being present, being where your feet are. Uh, so I, I'm curious, uh, has that taken time for you to be able to do that? Was it a, a light switch go on? Or, uh, you know, I guess I want to know about your journey and being in the moment. Well, I think it's, um, I think it was the great uh, uh, Protestant writer Calvin that said, I got a lot of work today, but I spent more time on my knees. So that was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, our, most of us, our default option is when we have a busy day, we tend to ignore the quiet time. We actually just forget about it and we convulsive. But I've learned in my, in my aging body here, the more I got to do, the more I got to set time to pray. And um, it's one of those things where I mean this, Mike, I am doing more. I'm doing less, but accomplishing more now. Okay. Because when you start quieting your mind, I, I don't want to make this into a, uh, you know, preaching fest here, but my faith is very important to me. But the older I get, the more I realize that God is not only is he everything, but he's perfect. He's perfect. And he only allows things to happen to you for your good. Right? Yep. You know, I just I just saw this documentary about the Star of Bethlehem and how, you know, God arranged the Star of Bethlehem to happen at this certain time and even the even the uh, you know um, uh, astrology uh, not, not astrology but the uh, what do you call those things like the Big Dipper and all those they all pointed to the star of Bethlehem and, yeah. and the, the eclipse of the sun happened. You know, you, you can predict the movement of the stars through these the physical principles uh, by a guy named uh, Kepler, like in the 1600s. So, so mathematicians have predicted that during Christ's death on the cross, there actually was an eclipse. You know, so God, God wouldn't allow these things to happen if he wasn't perfect. And if you can take that leap of faith and realize whatever befalls of me is for my good. So then you say to yourself, what do I got to lose? Take risks. And God's got my back. You know, I got, you know, some of the complications I learned in my, some of the complications that I've had in my surgeries over the years have been my best teachers, man. You know, a uh, couple of times, I'll tell you, I was probably a little overconfident. A couple of times I probably wasn't over my head. A few times I did had the stubborn Irishman. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I should have bailed or should have uh, called for help. no. You know, these hope, hope there's no lawyers on the call here when I say all this stuff, but um, um, those are the greatest gifts yeah. of my surgical career, my mistakes. Greatest gifts. Yeah. We learn more from our failures than our, than our, than our victories. Uh, well, you, well, you say to yourself, of that. Where's the, whatever happens, you say, here's where, here's where you can evolve the challenge. And this is real leadership too. Self-leadership. Don't forget, you have to manage your own life before you can effectively lead others, right? And if you look at uh, a great book of Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that was a game-changing book for me. He talked about how self-management really precluded the ability uh, to effectively lead others. You gotta take care of your own body, your own self. Otherwise you get into codependency, ego trips, whatever. To effectively lead others, you gotta be secure, right? So you can give from abundance. You can't give from neediness. I've been in, I've been the victim of certain leaders in my life that were just needy. They needed they needed the ego stroke. They needed the power, and that that's not leadership. That's just uh, that's called codependency, right? They're dependent on that power for their own egoic satisfaction. That's not leadership. Real leaders have their act together. They're they're confident. They're secure, and they give from their abundance. So Stephen Covey taught me, you know, number one, be proactive, right? Is there, and as a comedian, there's one of my comedic me, uh, heroes was a guy named Milton Berle said, if opportunity doesn't knock, find another door. Okay. Find another door. 
be proactive, make things happen. Number two, begin with the end in mind. In other words, what do you want your life to be at the end, right? What do you, what do you want people to say about your, uh, your funeral? What do you want on your tombstone? I told you I was sick. Nah, you want to say he was a good man. He was a good man. He walked the talk. He was a good husband, a good father. And number three, put first, first things first. So I first things first, my quiet time in the morning, and then I get my workouts in, and I get my time, my wife in. Those are, those are non-negotiables. First things first, right? And then I, you know, as a surgeon, you know, preparation is key. If I don't prepare, you know, uh, the great Woody Hayes, again, a football mon- uh, mentor, the five Ps, you know what the five Ps are? Poor mm-hmm. planning leads to, in my French, piss poor performance. You yep. know, if you don't plan, if you don't, uh, if you fail to plan, plan to fail. So tomorrow mm-hmm. is an hour day for me, and I've already spent a good half an hour going over my cases. I, I, and I walk in that room, I know exactly what to do. You know, don't, don't say, well, we'll see what it looks like. You know, no, 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 no. You, 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 you haven't done your job if you haven't planned. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yeah. I've learned that the hard way. So um, first things first. So Stephen Covey says those three things, you know, be proactive. First thing, well, begin with the end in mind. Put first things first. Then you get the self-mastery. And then once you have self-mastery, then you can learn how to effectively lead others. Because if you don't take care of your own <clears throat> basic needs and your own peacefulness, you won't be a leader. You just won't. You'll be a, you'll be a, uh, you'll be a parasite. You're, you're dropping some great books here. Uh, I've read a, a handful of them already. The, the two chairs, I have to read that one. Uh, but I think these are great books that I think uh, um, that everyone should read, uh, to be honest, especially if you're involved in, in medicine, because um, uh, was it, it was in um, yeah, Jim Collins' book, uh, Letter, uh, Love and Five Leadership. Uh, the difference between uh, fourth and fifth is the ability of that leader to leave and that that company keeps running. They, they, they don't they don't miss a beat. And to me, that was a big one. He gave an example of someone who was running one of these uh, good to companies left, and it, it, it went back down. It, it went down. It failed. So I think that's the difference between a, a four and five. Uh, that, and, and, that's, that's interesting to me. And, and leadership matters. You know, we. Uh... My friend, Mike Yusim, the my Wharton uh, friend who runs the McNulty Leadership Program, he gives a wonderful lecture on this, and maybe I can get him to do one of your podcasts, Mike. He's such a Great. gracious guy. But he talks about, if you look at, like, stock prices, certain companies, they'll give examples of, like, CEO is fired from, I'm not going to mention company X, and the stock price actually raises 20%, and they hire uh, CEO Y, and also in the stock Price goes up even thirty percent, and then you look at some of the returns of some people. Well, they look at look at Coach Moglia. Uh, you know, yeah. he 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 made a merit trade. I believe he increased their assets. Ready for this? Five hundred percent, and they just became they just merged with I think Schwab for like a multi billion dollar deal. You don't think leadership matters? Wow. Amen. So uh, yeah. So, 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 so to, 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 as we finish up here, Mike, I want to say that to the audience, leadership does matter, and it's about, you know, affecting the most good you can in this lifetime. You're going to need a certain skill set that some of it comes innately, but a lot of it has to be learned. And I've learned a good deal of it, and what I've learned more than anything is really uh, uh, creating. This is a Coach Campbell thing, and this is we got to leave with this. If you want to get a lot done in life. Coach Campbell is more about the team than the problem. So I'm here to say in January 4th, 2021, I'm reaping the benefit of establishing some great teams in my passions. So we have a leadership team. We have a, we have a leadership curriculum where I work at Penn. I have Drs. Dunnigan, DeMeo, Mike Yusim, Jeff Klein. We have a leadership team that now I'm just sitting back, just watching them f- just flourish. We have a leadership retreat. We have uh, leadership coaches for a fourth-year resident. Now we have a leadership fellowship. Second thing is writing. Every paper that I write, I establish a leadership team. I say, let's let's get this paper written. And I just sit back and I edit, and I let these, these young, wonderful minds take off. And the third thing is research. If I have at least a research question that I want to ask, what do I do? I get a team together. I say, let's, let's, let's ask this question, and let's answer this question. So I have 
PhDs, I have biomechanics, statisticians, whatever. But I, it, it, you, to do that, you have to know yourself and you have to know your weaknesses. So you have to take a very heroic look in the mirror. And as, as Father Scott would say, uh, feedback is the breakfast of champions. I'm great in ideas. I'm great with passion. I'm great with vision. I'm woefully inadequate in organization and woefully inadequate on, uh, you know, math and stats. So, so you got to know, so what do I do? I've aligned myself with people that fill that need. I've complimented my weaknesses. So, and so coach Campbell was like, when he, when he, when he ran Apple, he would say, we're going to be all right because for this problem, we got a great team. It's going to be all right. And guess what? He was right. The problem that was delegated to the team almost always worked out well because he had the right people in place. And then, and, 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 and finally, Leaders don't micromanage. They, they, they delegate. They give stewardship. And they say, "This is this is your gig. I'm um, here as a resource." And yeah, I will step in if I if you need help. But this is your baby. You know, you want to change someone's uh, the way they look at themselves. Give them a title. Give them some stewardship, and they look at themselves differently. As Stephen Covey would say, and then they have quantum change in the way they look at their lives. When you became a father, Mike, don't you look at life differently now? Oh, well, absolutely, night and day. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed this, Mike. I'm happy to help you. You're doing a wonderful thing here, and uh, maybe we can work on getting some other people on board. But uh, so the three books are would be uh, Seven Habits, Extreme Ownership, and The Happiness Advantage for starters, and also the fourth book, Two Chairs. And I could say those okay. uh, copies you share with the readers. This is this has been pretty cool, uh, really cool. I think there's a lot to be uh, learned here. I love the books. Thank you for bringing them up again. Uh, takeaways. Uh, morning quiet time meditation I think is important um, faith uh, if not number one that should be number one right uh, number one oh. go ahead no, me remember, that, remember this is, is, is the final soundbite in yeah. the end God wins the final soundbite shoot <laughs> in the end consecrate your life to your higher power and recognize mm -hmm. that at the end of the day God always wins so why fight it remember he's got your back he wants you to be the best you can be. He wants you to take risks. And where your passion and your skills meet the world's needs, that's your vocation. So young people out there, don't overthink it. What are you good at? What are you passionate about? Where is there a need that you can fulfill some service orientation? There's your vocation. The good Lord made me amphibious. I use both hands. And I love art. And I love people. There's a need for orthopedics. There's my there's my there's my vocation, my passion, my skills. There's a need. There's there it is, bruh. As we say in my old neighborhood, there you go, bruh. <laughs> I'm 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 wrapping up on that. That's perfect. Thank you again uh, for calling. This has been. Uh, I think I, I know I'm benefiting from this just, just as much as uh, any of our listeners. So thank you for that uh, uh, and for this opportunity. Mike, you're a good man. Keep 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 leading the way you do, my friend. More leader. leader. Th thanks for thanks for everything that you're doing. Seriously, it, it means a lot. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna myself. see you next week because my I'm gonna see you next week, Mike, because my back yep. goes out more than I do. <laughs> okay. All right, you're on the schedule. All right, guys, have a good night. <laughs> you too. Okay, thanks, Todd. Thank Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to the On Cue Performance Therapy Podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It would mean so much to me if you could leave us a five star review, so more listeners like you could get this important information. See you next time.